can go ahead and start, right? I was waiting for a heads up, but I, I'm the moderator, so I guess I get to say <laughs> when we start. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Acker. I am the lucky person to be um, moderating this panel of fine folks this afternoon. I want to let you know that um, books by the authors in this program uh, can be purchased from Greenlight Bookstore outside on the plaza. And um, everyone will be signing books immediately after this program uh, at the signing tables downstairs in the, in the rotunda. Um, so authors, at the conclusion of the program, we are all going straight to the signing tables. Those are instructions for us. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So we have with us uh, this afternoon uh, Nell Zink and Pichaya Sudbantar and Amitav Ghosh, who have all written um, diverting, stimulating, um, beautiful novels uh, that speak to a lot of issues of our current time. Um, I am not going to read their bios since you probably have them available in front of you, and I want to leave more time uh, for everyone to talk about their books and you know, um, maybe even just read a short passage to get um, to get a taste of the books. Uh, so the the you know the common theme uh, of these books and sort of uh, hinted by the panel title is um, about human nature, climate crisis, climate catastrophe. And because we had the, the climate strike and protests uh, this past weekend uh, here in New York, Pachaya, at least I, I know I saw some pictures that you were on the ground uh, <laughs> there, but um, I just thought I would ask to see if any of the authors uh, had been and, and what your impressions were and if there were any scenes that, um, that reminded you of your books or, or gave you thoughts for, for future books. Um, so Pachaya, why don't we start with you just oh. to launch there. Um, yeah, the climate strike was very, very inspiring. I, I was just so impressed by all the young people and older people who care about what's happening right now, who showed up in mass and just basically like put all their energies um, towards making this issue visible. Um, and I think that's very important. And I think it, it takes courage, as, as Greta ha has had said, um, to be able to confront what's happening and to have hope, but also to want to do something about it and to do it. Anything either of you want to add? Well, I, I was uh, in LA visiting my uncle who's 84 and has Parkinson's and in his old age, he's gotten kind of into this channel that's all Jimmy Swaggart all the time and, is, and Fox News. So I mostly saw the climate strike in the form of coverage on Fox News, which of course is very important research for a novelist. Um, my feeling about it is that, of course, that it's wonderful that this movement is forming. We need a lot of little Greta Thunbergs, or as they call her on Fox News, Thunbergs, <laughs> to, 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 um, to give the, the movement enough uh, breadth and power that people start talking about the really tough issues like <laughs> nuclear power. Uh, I happened to be in Seattle, so and I, I think it wasn't a very big uh, demonstration over there. Uh, so, but I was following it all on social media, and I must say it was just incredibly uh, exciting to see what was happening. Um, uh, you know, especially in Australia, which has such a terrible denialist kind of uh, uh, history in recent times. But I must say that uh, one thing which uh, did concern me uh, is that the crowds in, in Asia especially were not of the kind that I would have hoped for. I mean, there were a you know, few hundred people in New Delhi and in other places. And uh, you know, in, uh, basically in India, unless it's like half a million people, it's it, doesn't kind of, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So uh, I, I do think that the Extinction Rebellion and so on will have to make, um, will have to make connections with farmers groups and you know, fishing communities and so on if they're really going to have uh, an impact there. Trying, to, uh, you know, tying some of this to the the books that you've actually written, um, I wonder if there was a, a particular event um, that was happening somewhere in the world that you were watching or that you were experiencing when you started writing these books that have 
um, the climate, you know, at least one climate <laughs> catastrophe at, at its core. Was there um, a particular catalyst? Amitav, do we start with you? Uh, so, <clears throat> well, for me, uh, I would say that one of the catalysts, certainly for my l last book, uh, Gun Island, uh, was the European uh, migration slash refugee crisis that started in 2015, 2016. Because uh, I found myself obsessively looking at the pictures of these uh, 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 migrants and refugees crossing the Mediterranean in these rickety boats. And you know, the, uh, uh, everything that was said about these, uh, these crossings in the media suggested that these were uh, refugees from Syria or uh, sub-Saharan Africa and so on. But looking at the pictures, I could tell that a lot of them were actually South Asians. And uh, that was hardly ever mentioned. And I, I, you know, I just started wondering what's, uh, you know, what's going on. So I went to Italy and I traveled to a lot of these migrant and refugee camps and um, I spoke to a lot of people. And that was quite revelatory, I must say. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Um, for me, as someone who grew up in Bangkok, um, I'm someone who's always aware of water. Like Bangkok, as many other cities that were a part of this, um, of the colonial trade that's, that, that has happened over the past few hundred years, is, are situated in low-lying areas that's uh, right now very vulnerable to the climate crisis. Um, and even before we knew of this, Bangkok is, is always a place that, um, it's like Bangkok um, comes from Bangkok, which means like swamp of olives. So it began as, as this low-lying area. Um, and even when I was a young kid, we would always be kind of wary of thunderstorms and rain because um, things can flood really quickly. I have memories of walking across planks um, to get from one end of my grandmother's yard to the other. And then in 2010, 2011, there was a, a great mismanagement of water coupled with um, unusual uh, and I believe climate crisis related rainstorms um, that basically flooded a good majority of central Thailand. Um, and it's cataclysmic. You, we, I saw, you know, um, airports that were like near underwater, um, villages, entire neighborhoods, um, and you know, in, you know, if you, you think about what these business people are thinking, um, and there's all this, uh, there's flooding in all these industrial zones that, you know, basically incap incapacitated like the industrial capabilities of, of Bangkok. So it, it affected everyone, not just like the people, but also if you want to be capitalistic about it, like the, the systems that allow people to produce. So there was that, and helping my parents put up sandbags um, at our house in case the floods came, and we were just like watching the security camera, um, seeing like the water creep up, creep up, creep up closer to the curb. Um, and th thankfully, they were not affected. Um, and, I, and then I came back to New York, and a year later, there was Hurricane Sandy. Um, and I volunteered at, uh, at an evacuee shelter and saw like, what happens when um, we have like, refugees within our city. Like, people don't think of New York as a place, uh, often don't think New York, of New York as a place that's vulnerable, but we are. Um, a lot of, of neighborhoods in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in Queens are especially vulnerable to this. And these things definitely stirred my imagination when I projected um, what I saw of Bangkok into the future. I, I suppose my perspective is a little different since I grew up, um, you know, from the beginning, from, from when I was college age, involved in, in environmental groups and in, in, you know, directly or indirectly, I guess, climate activism, but, uh, but in, uh, sometimes on a very small scale where you're trying, say, to get uh, people to stop building on a barrier island so that it can stay mobile and continue to protect a salt marsh, things like that. Um, so that uh, sometimes when I hear a story about flooding, my first instinct is to think, should they have even had a house there? 
You know, if, if the name of the town is Swamp, <laughs> you know, was that not a message? But um, I, I think the big, one of the big events for me that changed my thinking about the natural world, I mean in an emotional way that just hurt me, was after the, the very well-known study about um, insect biomass in Germany came out a few years ago where these uh, citizen scientists had been working f for a long, long time collecting insects, and it turned out that the total biomass of flying insects had fallen by 80% over 30 years. And the minute that report came out, everyone was like, oh, right, yeah, no more insects on the windshield when I drive. Well, that didn't scare me so much, simply because, you know, farmers spray herbicides, they spray pesticide, they do no-till farming, that's just a matter of, oh, instead of plowing, we're going to spray herbicide now. Um, and so obviously you're going to have fewer insects, but it was when a study came out after that where in a forest preserve in Puerto Rico, they had fewer insects. And I thought, oh shit, wait a second, when you have bed bugs, you can get them out of your house by raising the temperature in the house to 114 degrees because of, you know, a bug will cook like a lobster. You know, climate, one hot day, if they can't find shade and dampness, will cook bugs. So it's like, you know, we, we're going to take nature out at the knees. Uh, that horrified me. Yeah. And there was just a study about birds, so that we've lost three billion birds in the last 30 years. You know, I think I just heard that in the, in the last couple of days. So definitely it's piling on the, the data. Um, I, um, in, in all of your books, you know, sort of going, happening alongside the various climate crises that are, that are woven throughout the books, there are these uh, dispersed families. And that's very much a, a part of uh, a part of the book, and you know, to greater or lesser extents, in, in your in your different books, but that are driven by um, escape, but also um, also economic migration too, is sort of la layered on top of this. Um, and so, I wonder if you could speak to the relationship between the you know the economic migration and the climate migration, and then of course just the individual internal things that that disperse families on a on sort of a, a nuclear personal level and how you how you navigated those threads when it came to um, to plot and to illuminating the the themes you wanted to hit in your book okay. well I've always been interested in this uh, in these uh, processes of you know how people lose their homes or become displaced or dislocated. And I think it must have something to do with the fact that, you know, my own family, we are originally from Bangladesh. But uh, the this, this story my father told, uh, used to tell about our family was that in the mid-19th century, a river changed course and swallowed up our village, so we had to start moving. So in fact, in, uh, you know, in 2016, 2017, when I started seeing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Bengali faces uh, in these pictures of the of the refugee crisis, I thought it probably was something very directly connected to climate. So I went off and I met uh, you know these refugees and uh, in Italy, and what was interesting was that actually you know uh, environmental disasters played a large part in the, uh, in their migration. Some of them had lost their lands, or rather you know the seasons had become so unpredictable. They couldn't farm as they used to. But uh, I think it was, the, the situation is actually much more complicated than I had thought. I mean, for one thing, technology also plays a very large part in, uh, in enabling these movements. That's something I hadn't really been aware of. But uh, I really, uh, the, the people who make these journeys, uh, you know, these intercontinental journeys and across the Mediterranean and so on, uh, their cell phones are absolutely critical to the whole process. Uh, they make their payments through the cell phones. Uh, so in, in some strange way, I think it's not so much that climate change is causing these migrations, but that the migrations and climate change are both effects of a kind of acceleration that we are seeing in the world. Um. 
I think there is definitely um, a kind of like privileged distance in which like we in America, we in a lot of the developed world view climate, the climate crisis. Um, we kind of think of it as being something that's uh, a forward future vision. But for a lot of the world, this is the present day. This is the reality. Um, and you know, you, you talk about technology, and th it is something that we're now able to view live, like the catastrophe of others, as if it were some kind of like um, maybe not entertainment, but something that we that just like occupies us, but isn't entirely real. And I think that what's happening and what is causing urgency is that that we in this developed and privileged place are losing that exceptionalism and the effects of the climate crisis is creeping closer and closer and closer so that that privilege does not exist anymore. Um, and the, the refugee crisis that we view as something that's happening elsewhere, um, those things are gonna happen here and almost anywhere in the world when I see um, you know, when I saw what happened in Bangkok, when I saw what happened in Brooklyn that I experienced from, for myself, I just realized that we are living in this like aquarium and like whatever someone does in another part it affects another part. It's, it's like a connected by um, technology, connected by, um, you know, over, uh, over accelerating capitalism by, by all the things that we have thought to be beneficial, but it's now we know to be pretty destructive. Yeah, I would say that the climate crisis, you know, it's called the refugee crisis. I mean, there are a lot of people who say the whole conflict in Syria started because of a drought in this one valley in Syria, and all the farmers started moving around and being restless or something, but the fact that the crisis creates such dramatic photographs and video um, has nothing to do with the volume of it, because, you know, huge movements of human beings around the world are completely normal now. Billions of people ride planes every year. Something like three billion people took a plane trip last year. When you think about the mere seven billion on the planet, that's pretty impressive. Um, the, what causes those dramatic pictures is the EU policy that if a, uh, an airline flies someone into an EU country and their asylum application is rejected, they have to fly the person home again. So it might cost them three or four hundred dollars. So if the EU had not put out that directive in, I think, 2003 or something, these people would just get on airplanes, fly across the Mediterranean, apply for asylum in the airport in Frankfurt like they used to do, and w we wouldn't be watching them die. And, and I think that's just a good, good illustration about how this entire crisis is desired there's someone out there who wants it, who wants these pictures. You know, why? We have to ask ourselves, why, why are we being manipulated this way? Why are we being forced to watch people drown who could be flying on planes with the rest of us? Um, you know, it causes xenophobia. It causes conservatism. It causes fear. It causes these pictures of people, you know, up against chain link fences rattling them because they, when they go to the airport to, to exercise their rights, they're turned away by stingy airlines because of an EU directive. You know, it's, I, anyway, that's what occurs to me. <laughs> I was, I, when Amitav mentioned technology, I was thinking, um, well, here, here's a force that is perhaps helping to build uh, empathy and awareness, you know, uh, and realization of, um, of this crisis that's happening uh, all over the world. And then you brought up the other side of the technology, which is sort of a potential exploitation, or of course, any image can be used in several ways, or um, an image can be framed in 
in different ways. Uh, so I wonder if you have any sort of additional thoughts about the uses of um, uh, of technology as you know in in our in our current moment. And I'm thinking of that moment in your book where there's where everyone is on the boat and everyone's watching. You know, the whole world is watching the refugees on this boat in the Mediterranean and wondering whether the refugees will be let into Italy or not. Um, but is it, yeah, it, are there any, sort of any additional thoughts about the, the, the uses of tech technology that we're facing now? Uh, certainly, uh, I do think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's in, how should I say, mesmerizing to watch, uh, you know, uh, to watch these images. But I think, uh, on the whole, you know, uh, these technologies, especially social media technologies, have had a profoundly destabilizing effect uh, uh, um, upon the world. And you know, for one thing, as you say, it feeds into many right-wing kind of memes and um, fears and so on. But it also destabilizes people who begin to think that, you know, well, why don't I just go away? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, Navid, Kerm Navid Kermani, he's a German writer, but of, of uh, Iranian descent, and he wrote a wonderful book where he followed these refugees. Uh, it's Kermani, like a K-H, I mean, I you know it, him? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you've read the book. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> but but he, he um, follows the refugee trail backwards from Germany. You know, this was after Angela Merkel stood there in the summer of 2015 and said, we can do it, you know, open arms, welcome refugees. And all the other European countries said, okay, we're not gonna check their ID anymore. We're just sending them through. And, and word of this got back to like Afghanistan. People who were living peacefully and cheerfully said, oh, Germany's open now? Okay, I'll, I'll hit the road. It, and they were doing what, just this simply, you can't, they're not really refugees, they're just exercising a basic human freedom to move around that we take for granted. And this opportunity, this once in a lifetime chance to do something that I do every other day was offered to them through a political decision. I, you know, I have trouble focusing on technology. Um, I think technology is something that contributes to our wishfulness about solutions. Um, I think at the present, we keep thinking that there's gonna be a technological solve for everything that's happening. Um, the reality is, is people come out with, um, you know, we're gonna like sequester carbon and talk about these, these technologies that when you actually look at them are just like entirely inefficient and improbable to solve what we need to happen within the time that we have. Um, and technology has also, is also something that is like a part of this, um, this conversion, I think, that is inherent to capitalism in the sense that it's something that is, conver is converting real life into a make-believe that is then commoditized. Um, and it's a part of this, like what uh, what I think is um, how we don't value like our our own life, and then that makes it easier for us to devalue like, the life of others and then the planet. When a lot for a lot of us, we're not we're not cherishing this, you know, just our own experiences. We are we're looking at things on social media. We're looking at things that do not exist before us. And when you think about what we are chasing, what we go and pursue every day, we, we aren't thinking about, oh, is this making me happy? Is this creating a better world? We're chasing these units of, of monetary make-believe. And then it all feeds back because you have like this greater um, tendency of technology to, to basically work with capitalism to basically exacerbate and enlarge itself so that you have life that is then converted to stocks and then is then made even more unreal by becoming derivatives and then you have um, derivatives of derivatives and each one takes on a greater systematic effect and modeling so that it loops back and becomes even even more destructive um, 
and I don't mean to be like an anti-technologist, but I do think that it's being played with, it's being pre presented and produced with a kind of recklessness that we should not have. But that's, that happens in a very concrete way when, you know, when uh, there are derivatives for soy futures, so they flatten some rainforest to plant soy uh, because the planet is regarded simply as a place to store and mm -hmm. propagate money. Yes. C could I say something about the carbon sequestration? Because oh, yes. I, I had the most amusing conversation at a wedding, like way out in the middle of nowhere near Berlin not long ago. With, this wedding was full of journalists because two journalists were getting married. And there was a guy there who happened to be the, a botanist and the director of the Max Institute for Biology in Berlin, a real expert. And I was thrilled to meet him. And I said, OK, what needs to happen? And he says, well, it's simple. We need to take all the excess value that could be invested because economic growth causes carbon to be generated. We need to take all the money in the world and spend all of it on paving the Sahara with solar panels. And with this energy, we take carbon, all the carbon that has been put for, into the air with fossil fuels since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, since, in other words, since Europeans realized they cut down all the trees and needed a new kind of fuel, um, we're going to put it all in the ground in the Sahara. And I don't know how this is going to work, but, and it's going to be very inefficient, but that's good because the more it costs, the better off we'll be. And if we do that, we'll be fine. <laughs> Phew, I'm relieved. <laughs> um. Well, switching gears maybe a little bit. Um, one of the one of the aspects of, of your books that I that I really enjoyed was its sort of very particular attention to vocation and to passion. Like all of the, the characters in these books have things that they are passionate about and that they're they're pursuing. And now in your book, there there is music and there is climate activism also. And um, in Pachaya, in your book, there is not only you know sort of political demonstration, but there's a character who's a photographer and another who's a restaurant owner, and there are several scholars in your book, Amitav, who are each sort of passionate, passionate a marine biologist and a rare book stealer. So there, these are people who all have their you know, unique driving passions, and um, I wonder if you could talk about those in the construction of your characters. How, you know, how necessary were these vocational passions in, in constructing uh, these people in, in your books? Now maybe we'll start with you. Well, um, in, in my book, there are two generations. There's a parent generation that is um, art damaged. They're very 80s, 90s kind of people. And uh, they, they figure other people are worried about nature and the environment. They're, they're concerned about whether or not they're going to ever make a living as musicians. Probably not. Um, and then a younger generation, their daughter born in 92, who Work, who grows up in this, uh, at, at, she goes to a progressive school and she's got this think globally, act globally ethic that young people tend to have now. And so she, her passion, it, it, passion works very differently for these two generations because the one has a very capital R romantic 19th century idea of how they have to be driven to, um, to do their art, whereas she is, she wants to serve a cause. She's, she wants to be a servant. It's more of a, not salvation by faith, but salvation by works that she's after. She wants to find out what could be done to save the planet and then submit herself to uh, this higher cause. And the, cause, the method she chooses is to specialize in soil management. But but then her power is so limited, so she's in this constant tension between the scale of her ambitions and, and looking for someone to follow simply because her power is so tiny compared to the task at hand that she needs to find a powerful force she can throw, you know, put her weight behind and it's not there. Um, I haven't thought about vocation in my character, so um, I'm coming up with the generalization that a lot of them, I think, have to do with, um, like, their vocations are related to some kind of 
documentation. So the photographer, um, even the restaurant owner who um, is running a restaurant in, in, um, in the outskirts of Tokyo, um, in Yokohama, is trying to replicate some, some recipes that is from her memory of it um, in Thailand. And then there are other characters, there's an, uh, an archivist, there is uh, a person who is, I'm not, trying to not give too much away, but is um, using technology to basically stitch together the world back in some way using memory. Um, so I think a part of, maybe it's from my own experience of um, being an immigrant and being someone who is displaced from where I was born and having lived in other, in many other places that I'm, for me the vocations have to do with, with trying to preserve in, in some futility what, what we have lost or are losing and that's something that, you know, is definitely going to be present in the case of a climate crisis. It's about how do we like keep and preserve our culture when everyone in every place is submerged or, or dried out or how do we keep on as a humanity that has all these different cultural lives without being flattened to, to just like, you know, like the lower strata of like Mas Maslow's hierarchy of like how do we just survive, so. I think my, voc my character's vocations might have to do with that. Yeah, I like that answer. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, about 15 years ago, I published a novel uh, that was set in um, the Sundarbans, which is this vast mangrove forest in uh, southern Bengal. And uh, the ce uh, central character in that book was a marine, uh, marine mammal specialist, a cetologist, uh, who studies the Irrawaddy dolphin, uh, which is a kind of a uh, freshwater dolphin uh, that lives in the Irrawaddy, but also in the Mekong and in, uh, in southern Bengal. So to do that, uh, I, I followed uh, a young uh, cetologist, uh, you know, a New Zealander who was working in, uh, uh, in Cambodia. And we did a river survey of, uh, uh, of, the Mekong, of the Irrawaddy dolphins in the upper Mekong, just south of the Laos border. And it was really, I, I would say, one of the most exciting and uh, incredible experiences of my life. So I suppose that experience keeps coming back. Did you get to swim with dolphins? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, in a sense, but you know what, the dolphins <laughs> aren't very interested in you. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Uh, so if anyone has one, we'd love to hear them. Well, that's a very interesting question, actually, because uh, I wrote a, a trilogy of novels of, um, which were basically about the 19th century opium trade, in which a very large number of uh, Americans, especially people from Brooklyn, participated, uh -huh. except that they were pushing opium on the Chinese, you know? And it's so strange that, uh, you know, that context never arises in relation to the current opioid cri crisis in America. You know, it's always thought of as, uh, uh, you know, something completely exceptional, different, etc. But actually, it's uh, eerily, uncannily <laughs> like uh, the 19th century um, uh, opium trade, you know? And, uh, you know, I'm glad that they're getting uh, the Sackler name taken off these buildings and so on. But, you know, if you set about that systematically, uh, just as with the slave trade, I don't think you're going to have many buildings left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Peabody's, uh, uh, Brown University was financed with the opium money, Harvard, Yale, I mean, up and down the East Coast. It was, opium money was just swilling around, you know, and these people, for some reason, were great philanthropists. Uh, <laughs> so, it's in everything. Um, you forgot to say that people are addicted to meat. <laughs> meat. Meat. I mean, one of the most... Unfortunately, a very destructive force 
right now in human society is meat and uh, I live in Germany so I you know I see it every day they import soy from South America feed it to pigs in Germany export the pork to China but but the pig shit stays in Germany and lands on the ground and what it's gotten to the point where the groundwater in Germany in some parts of western Germany is so rich in nitrates that it actually has the same concentration as fertilizer after you dilute it to put it on a field. So you could literally just take well water and put it on a field. And, and this is because of the trade in, in meat. Uh, I'd like to add there, though, that uh, you're referring to industrial meat. Uh, oh, I'm a great fan of, of uh, uh, free range uh, organic meat. Uh, see, pa pastoralist peoples like those oh. in India or Heaven in bless them. much of Africa, <laughs> uh, for them it's an essential nutritional source. So, you know, I think one. It's also terrific be... for the environment. Yeah. When people do so. e extensive low impact agriculture. Mm -hmm. Time for maybe one, one more question? Okay. It's only 20 hours. I just want everyone out of the room there. But yeah, may, probably maybe two more questions. Um, yeah, anyone? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, the question was how much of my own life goes into my books? Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, a lot. I mean, uh, one, every writer draws upon their experience in one way or another, but I don't think my books are limited by my life. That would be very boring. <laughs> you know? So obviously, you know, one tries to reach into other people's lives as well and to see what one can find. Does anyone else want to answer that question? Um, I try to not write about my own life as much as possible. So I, I hope that what I've artificially constructed based on some minor threads of, of what I know can uh, entertain people enough. I would say that my fiction is strictly limited to my own life. I mean, what else am I going <laughs> to write about? But uh, I, I change it up. <laughs> Anyone else? There's a question over here. Oh, yeah, great. So the question was, does climate dread uh, influence how you write fiction? And what was the second part? And how you think about future readers. And how you think about future readers. What future readers? <laughs> <laughs> Spoken with a lot of No, friends. no, I, I, that was a joke. <laughs> if, if anything is going to survive climate change, it's going to be people consuming media. Well, that's cheery. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, I, I think that, that climate dread did play a role. Um, when I was trying to imagine a future Bangkok, I didn't set out to write about uh, uh, this drowned city, this, this climate change place, um, but I could not help but just from everything that's happening from the 99% scientific consensus, see a very different city than the one that I know. Um, and if there's something very tempting to write about, um, you know, like dread brings anxiety, brings like the worst, brings out the worst fears. And I was tempted to write about like a more dystopic future than I did. But I, I drew back because just from what I've seen, in, even in, in the worst catastrophes, um, there's also this human tendency to try to pull back towards normalcy as much as possible so that even when things are bad, people are 
trying to keep their pets alive, are trying to walk their pets, are trying to tell stories to their kids, are trying to um, do the things that, that to them, to us, are normal. Um, and I think that that's true from what I have personally seen. Um, so it was, it was a, a, a dread that I think is also hedged by um, a kind of belief that, that it will not be 100% bad. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, uh, we have to be careful about classifying everything as climate because I think, you know, this, the crisis that we're in, uh, it's, it's the meeting point of many, many different things. So the dread that we experience uh, should be a much more generalized dread. <laughs> <laughs> I think, in fact, we can do away with each other long before the climate does it. <laughs> Dread is much too narrow. Yeah. I mean, I, a more I, expansive version. Before the climate, there were nuclear weapons. I mean, when I was in college, you know, there was a ritualized dread about uh, the arms race, and and you have to ask, qui bono? Because uh, all dread, all fear, makes people conservative. That's what it does. You know, it, this is social psychologists are not putting up big question marks about this one. If you're scared, then you think about, okay, my family, is my family okay? You don't give a shit about anybody else. The, the fear makes you selfish, it makes you conservative. Those are synonyms, by the way, literally. <laughs> um, so I, I think anything you can do to cut out on the fear and stop talking about the fear and stop talking about worst case scenarios is a step in the right direction. Well, I have um, not so much about, about climate, but about place. So I'm someone who's very interested in, in sense of place. And there are so many different interesting places, um, both in the present and in, in the future, uh, in your books. And I wonder if you could say a couple of sentences about um, how you thought about rendering those places that your audiences might not know. Um, and was, is there anything that you do to remind you of those places if they're places you haven't seen or been to in, in, in a long time or, or maybe even never have? Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a scene in my book which is set in Los Angeles um, where there's a wildfire advancing towards uh, a, a, a very famous museum. And that actually happened, uh, you know, in 2017. Uh, the Getty Museum suddenly found itself facing this a raging wildfire. But you know, the strange thing was that I wrote that section uh, long before <laughs> this happened, about six months before. So it was kind of so uncanny just to see it, uh, you know, unfolding like that. Yeah. Um, for me, um, a lot of, I feel like a lot of writers start off a piece because of a certain character or a voice. Um, and for me, um, place is sort of like the starting point for whatever reason and it acts as almost a kind of stage and I'm sort of powerless as to who, like, who walks in and out of the stage and they just show up um, and that's why how I think my, my novel was influenced in, in taking um, course over 200 years and ha involving this uh, menagerie of characters because, because to, to have a novel of place um, you need more than one perspective is not enough. So I think that place definitely played a role. And I have written novels about places, other novels, The Wall Creeper, Mislaid. But this one is, um, I, I use very familiar settings, New York City and Washington, D.C., uh, simply because I was focusing on characters so strongly in this one. And uh, what, what, what drove the choice for you know, starting with characters versus place for this particular book? Well, b because it was setting in cities and the places I'm passionate about tend to be, um, well, I had an interesting story to tell about uh, the rural south in the 1980s in Mislaid because it was such a strange place. And um, the wall creeper focuses on environmental problems facing uh, Central Europe and, and Southeastern Europe. 
And uh, whenever you use nature in a book at all, of course it uh, cites you very, in a very concrete way um, in, in a certain uh, environment, but uh, urban environments have a tendency to resemble each other, and it's the people in them that make them what they are. And I think that the, you render the cities quite distinctly. I and mean, they're New York and DC; they're familiar, but um, but they don't seem like like each other. Oh, so I'm selling myself short, huh? That's a, a <laughs> yeah, exactly. bad habit of mine. <laughs> Thank um, you. Welcome. I think we're out of time. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Uh, please come with us. We'll be uh, signing books downstairs, right? Down what does the chair mean? <laughs>